Hello and welcome to Nesta Talks, Nesta's event series where we have conversations with leading thinkers, social entrepreneurs and practitioners. Um, this is the first time we're doing this um, through a webinar, so please do give us feedback on how this is working for you. Um, my name is Ravi Gurumurthy and I'm the, the new Chief Executive of Nesta, so delighted to be able to host this uh, conversation today and particularly delighted to have um, Adam Kacharsky with us, who's a man in great demand, not least because he has the most timely book out ever, called The Rules of Contagion, Why Things Spread and Why They Stop. And Adam's day job is, is the Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And his work involves thinking about how impacts of social behavior and immunity um, happen and how outbreaks of infectious diseases and other phenomena occur. So it's gonna be an incredibly insightful and timely conversation. Um, and what I hope we can cover is first of all, some background conceptual framework about how we even think about this issue. We're all armchair epidemiologists these days, so Adam's gonna hopefully educate us about how to think about this in the right way. We'll then talk a bit about the lessons of the past, particularly how things have played out in the last few months, and then spend quite a bit of time talking about the future and what we can do to mitigate the worst consequences. Um, we'll also have plenty of time for questions, so do please um, put those up and we'll um, be working through the ones that are most popular. So, Adam, thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. Um, before we jump into actually talking about um, the book and, and, and all the issues that are in it, um, tell us a bit about yourself and your research work and how you ended up working on this incredible issue. Yeah, um, my background originally is in maths. I did my, my degree in that and I did a PhD in, in applied maths. Um, but increasingly became interested in, in trying to understand the processes uh, that drive biological systems. Uh, I think in, in sort of biology and extending that to kind of human behavior and all these kind of aspects um, presents more of a challenge because we don't know the underlying rules of, of often what's driving things. You know, for physics, we have all these kind of nice equations that you see at school and you know, if you drop something, it kind of behaves as gravity would predict. But with biology, there's often a lot more uncertainty and a lot more kind of uh, potential, I think, to, to understand what the dynamics might be doing. And I, I made my way into the, the field of infectious diseases and then worked really increasingly on, on outbreaks, uh, looking at aspects of, of behavior, particularly directly, uh, what we call directly transmitted pathogens, things that go from one person to another. Um, worked a lot on influenza um, and really trying to understand what are these things that drive outbreaks? Why do they look like they do? Um, and then, yeah, as over the years, uh, larger epidemics have emerged, Ebola, Zika, um, most recently COVID-19, doing a lot of work to try and understand how they're spreading, but also how we, how we can control them. You know, interventions that are going in, what effect are they having and, and what could we maybe do differently? And I, I read somewhere that you'd said that once you've um, studied one epidemic, you've only studied, studied one epidemic, i.e. there aren't necessarily huge generalizable um, findings. But in a way, your book is all about um, this phenomena writ large, not just within the health field, but how crime um, propagates or how social media works. So just tell us a bit about um, the book and, and, and what is the more general theory that you're articulating? Yeah, so the, the, the point I made, yeah, if you've seen one epidemic, you've seen one epidemic, uh, I think is always worth having it at the back of your mind because I think it's very simple um, to just take you know, it's very tempting often as well to, to sort of take what's happened previously and then just lift it and put it immediately on the situation you're faced with and, and really the point of the book is to to look a bit more deeply at, at what's going on so rather than superficially saying you know this epidemic's happened before therefore the new one's going to be like this or this trend has spread in this way before therefore the new one's going to behave like this really to try and look at, at the factors that, that are driving outbreaks. In many cases, um, really from, from everything from kind of financial crisis to, um, to things like violence, to things like um, you know, the spread of memes on the internet, what the book tries to do is, is highlight some of the ideas that maybe have appeared in other fields uh, and have been very useful in understanding these things, but maybe have been ignored in, in other aspects of life. So for example, one thing I look at is um, how post-2008, uh, central banks looked a lot at the, the science of how um, STDs spread through sexual partnerships, because those, those network ideas actually told us a lot about the problems that were driving uh, the 2008 financial crisis. So it's almost like another field had already thought about that and, and worked out what was going on, but that hadn't made its way across. And I think that there's a lot of examples of that where 
people are essentially remaking the mistakes that have already been made uh, in the study of contagion in other fields. And just say a little bit more about some of the examples within the book, because as I said earlier, you talk about violent crime in Chicago and all sorts of other phenomena. Exactly. Yes. There's, there's a few different, I mean, there's, there's many things in life that, that spread. And uh, so one example is this, this gun violence in Chicago. And I think I just a realization more broadly in the study of violence that these aren't just random incidents, that often there is some predictable structure, for example, in, in gang violence, in the network of, of interactions and, and how different gangs and groups are linked. Um, and often one event will spark retaliatory attacks or kind of follow-up shootings maybe weeks, months later. And so understanding those links and understanding that process of, of contagion allows you to go in and, and potentially intervene. And that's very similar in terms of the the kind of conceptual framework to what we're currently doing with things like coronavirus in terms of contact tracing, that you have a case, you identify people who may be at risk of becoming subsequent cases. And the idea of, of isolation and quarantine is to prevent that, that follow-up transmission happening. And a number of groups um, in the US are doing it. In Glasgow, there's been this public health um, research unit for, for violence and really using these, these kind of measures, thinking about contagion, thinking about what kind of evidence you need rather than maybe the slightly more simplistic thing of, you know, it's just down to bad people or it just happens, but really kind of thinking more systematically about what's driving these. Um, another just quick example I think online we see as well is how we're handling misinformation. I think a few years ago, there was this idea that we just need to get rid of bad content online and that will somehow fix it. And it's really akin to an infectious disease saying, well, why don't we just find all the cases and then we can isolate them and then we'll be, be sorted. And of course, no one would ever tackle an epidemic like that because, of course, you can't find all the cases always. You need to think of other ways. And I think we're seeing now a lot of platforms realize that. If you, if you look, search for coronavirus, platforms will preemptively message you um, with reliable content because they know that there's misinformation out there. But it's almost a kind of vaccination strategy that you're trying to get better information into people's attention uh, earlier rather than just trying to chase down all of the possible misinformation out there. So, so what are the entry-level mistakes we're making as amateur epidemiologists? You must be seeing all sorts of misunderstandings. And, and what, are the right, what are the right concepts to actually get your head around this issue? Yeah, so I think there's a few, um, a few things out there that can kind of get you quite far um, along, along the way. So I think one of the most um, important things uh, to bear in mind with a lot of interpretation of data, particularly in outbreaks, is the delay effects you see. Um, in that, for example, um, there's a lot of focus at the moment on, on the number of deaths for coronavirus um, in the UK and then saying we're two weeks behind Italy in terms of the outbreak. But if you think about it, um, generally, there's, if you get infected with coronavirus, it takes about five or so days to become ill. And then once you become ill, it often takes um, a week or two to go to hospital and then another week or two for it to be a fatal outcome if, if that's what happens. So this, there's about a delay of a month between infection and death in, in that situation. So the deaths that are occurring now are really telling you about infections that happened a month ago. So I think when we're looking at the, these, these data on, on UK and Italy, we're not really saying the UK is two weeks behind Italy. What we're saying is transmission in the UK four weeks ago is similar to transmission in Italy six weeks ago. And I think there, there's often, you know, for many other data sets, we see something similar that um, you know, for example, in, in terms of studying things online, we might look at the final outcomes of, of someone's behavior. They might click on something or buy something, but we're not seeing the kind of upstream um, things that maybe we're actually more interested in, in terms of ideas and, and beliefs. And so I think that's one thing that's, that's kind of really crucial to bear in mind. I think another is also just being able to, um, to measure transmission. But I think some, some people have this idea that this doesn't spread very easily. I've seen some claims that this will infect absolutely everyone you come into contact with. So I think really think, thinking through the, the scale involved, I saw one um, sort of viral tweet the other day that said, you only infect 1% of your contacts. And if you think about that, for coronavirus on average, each person infects two or three others. So imagine you're only infecting 1% of your contacts. So that means while you're infectious, on average, you've got to make two or 300 close contacts. And, and that's everybody in the population has got to be doing that. And that's, that's simply not something that, that lines up with reality. And if you just think through the kind of scales you're talking about, very quickly, it's clear that, that there's a gap there. So I think there are these, these things that as soon as you just 
take that extra step of logic, you can very quickly work out whether something's reasonable or not. Great, thanks. So just looking back on the last few months, um, one question I had for you is that when I hear ministers, they always say, um, you know, we're following the science as though science is monolithic and all scientists are in agreement. Yeah. Um, what I'd love to know is where in the scientific community has there been great consensus and certainty and where has been, where's the debate been raging in the last weeks and months? Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe just give a sense of, of how these, how evidence feeds into the decisions. I think there's been a lot of, sort of speculation about what's going on um, in the background. And so there's, as you said, there's no, one single bit of science or single mathematical model that, that tells the government what to do. What, what you have in reality is a whole range of studies, um, many of which might agree, some of which might disagree, all looking at kind of different aspects. So, you know, we've done some studies, even just trying to put a number on it, you know, how easy does this thing spread? The measures that went in in China in kind of end of January, what effects were they having? Um, there's other studies of, of different control measures, what they might be doing. And then what typically happens is you have these, um, these advisory groups and there will often be quite a lot of disagreement about the details, but they'll try and find some consensus. So they might say, for example, you know, we think if this epidemic isn't controlled, the majority of cases will occur within a one month period. And all the groups with all their separate models and analysis will say, yeah, we've, we've actually looked at this independently and we're pretty happy that that's going to happen. I think where there has been um, a lot of debate and not just in terms of the models, but, but further up, it's obviously um, exactly you know, when different interventions will go in and what combination is optimal. And, and certainly the work we do, we're not telling governments what to do. What we do is lay out scenarios and say, if you have this kind of control measure, it's likely you'll see this kind of impact. If you have this control measure, you might see something different. And then I think that the real tough decisions come where you have to try and balance all these things because you, know, you might not, want to put a lockdown in place for six months you might say well feasibly we think we can do it for two months and then the models can guide that but ultimately the decision of, of when you put that in is something that's that's really kind of needs to be made by politicians and when i was working in government i used to work closely with um the chief scientist in the energy and climate change department a guy called david mckay wonderful wonderful man and one of his biggest bugbears was um the failure to communicate uncertainty and the whole process of synthesizing information and simplifying it for lay ministers meant that you didn't convey the error bars and, and, and look at different scenarios. Do you think that we are conveying that rich information on uncertainty to ministers? I think it, it's, it's a, it is a tough balance because you, know, you, you don't want to say we have no idea what you know, <laughs> the, the outbreak might be huge, it might be tiny, we have no idea. And I think you, you can narrow it down in, in, in some respects. So I think we do have... Uh, uncertainty for example around exactly how transmissible it is but we can model scenarios on that range I think the key thing is whether the conclusion changes that I think it's it's easy to get hung up on details of saying you know there's going to be 100 cases this week or 110 cases or, or this sort of thing whereas actually both of those conclusions say you're going to have a problem if this keeps growing and so I think what we try and do is identify um, really the conclusions that hold even if you, you do the, the sort of analysis slightly differently. I mean, one example um, is early on, we looked at the impact of these lockdowns in, in China. And at the, that kind of period in late January, early February, um, the Chinese data seemed to slow down a bit. And a lot of, of media and kind of commentary was around, well, maybe they've just hit testing capacity. And it's not actually a slowdown. They've still got this, this really accelerating epidemic, and that's just not reflecting the data. And so we didn't just look at the, the, the case data, we actually looked at a whole bunch of other data sets. We looked at all these evacuation flights that were coming out of China towards the end of January, where they were testing everyone before they went back to the UK or other places. And we got that same conclusion about this really big reduction in transmission, no matter how we combined the different data sets. And so we were pretty confident that although each, you know, each model output was slightly different and the exact mm -hmm. reduction, the exact timescale varied a bit, that overall conclusion held no matter how uncertain we were about one particular data set. So I think that's, that's how we try and get around it. And when did you actually know that, for instance? Because one of the, obviously the big critiques is that we've been incredibly slow to respond. I think Richard Horton, the editor of The, of the Lancet, um, tweeted, I can't help but feel angry that it's taken almost two months for politicians and even experts to understand the scale of the change. Those dangers were clear from the very beginning. We've wasted seven weeks. This crisis was entirely preventable. So 
if you if you sort of rewind back to December and January, yeah. wasn't it obvious that we needed to be ordering ventilators, getting protective equipment in place, ordering testing at that point? Um, it wasn't because uh, it, it, internationally, um, the, the data coming out of China provided no indication, certainly in late December, early um, early January. I mean, so to be clear, you know, they had a cluster of unusual pneumonia cases, which is always going to be a concern given what we know about SARS. I think the difference between this is a concern and we need to work out what's going on versus this is a rapidly growing epidemic and we have a serious problem. And actually, I think the, well, the first bits of analysis that really identified the scale of what we're facing was um, Imperial College had a report out in mid-January that looked at how many cases were appearing in other countries. So although only 41 cases, I think, have been 41, 44 maybe, uh, have been reported in, in Wuhan, three cases had already uh, traveled and, and been detected in other countries. And so a very quick probability calculation suggests there's not that many people who travel out of Wuhan. So if three travelers have already appeared elsewhere, they reckon potentially a few hundred, a, a thousand or two would, would be infected. So I think we did have those signals quite early on, and it was, it was modeling that, that informed a lot of that. But of course, what happens next in terms of how that translates to preparedness and, and policy is a different question. But at that point, so that was mid-January, and I think the World Health Organization warned about a pandemic at the end of January. At that point, shouldn't we have been taking this a lot more seriously? Or were, you know, was there still uh, not much clarity amongst the scientific community that this was going to become serious? Um, I think it was very quick that it, it was becoming serious. I think but part of the evidence base that was still emerging was the extent to which um, these kind of traditional containment measures, so the measures that were used against SARS, um, would be effective. Because it, it, it seemed pretty clear evidence that there had been a long period of undetected transmission in China or unreported transmission, whatever had happened. They had a large number of cases growing. I think by the end of, of January, um, it, it was clear that they would need to put pretty substantial things in. They were starting to lock down, and, and we estimated that that was having some effect. But then it was this question of, um, could we use the measures that worked against SARS? So, for example, identifying cases, testing them, isolating them. And I think there was some thinking, and, and we did some analysis around that period in, in mid late Jan, showing that if you could trace enough of people's contacts, it's likely that it was containable. And I think that's what, um, for example, uh, Singapore and, and Korea have done very well recently, that they've, they've managed to keep transmission very low doing that. Um, but I think there were two two kind of follow-ups that, that didn't necessarily work as well. So I think one is that method of um, identifying cases and following their contacts. Clearly in Europe, that hasn't been sufficient as it was implemented to control it. Um, and then I think also that the background preparedness of if this isn't controllable, what's this going to look like? I think you know, we are in a situation where we, we haven't got large-scale testing at the moment and we haven't got these other measures. Um, I'm not familiar with the, the exact logistics of of when those decisions could have been taken and, and what would have improved that. But I think we are in a situation where um, we do now have a lot of transmission and you know, we probably do need more um, capacity and resources to deal with it. Um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you, you make certain assumptions like about feasibility um, in your modeling. So you might assume that you can't lock down a population for a certain period of time. Um, and I remember hearing at one point, the, the notion of behavioral fatigue that we can't do a big clampdown for a long period of time because people will get sick of it. Therefore, we've got to time the, the clampdown at the right point. But where do those assumptions about feasibility and behavioral fatigue come from? Because there's probably not, I can't believe there's any evidence really to, to illuminate those discussions. Yeah, so we, we don't um, put in a hard assumption about, you know, you can only shut down for three weeks or something. And I think, to be honest, a lot of the... Um, the messaging that's been coming out from, from a lot of other governments about we're putting in a two-week lockdown. Uh, I think it's been quite misleading. We've seen another con a number of countries who've had a two-week lockdown and have just extended it by another two weeks, and they're going to extend it again, I'm sure. Yeah. So I think having that acknowledgement is going to take a longer period of time. And so what we it often did in, in scenario analysis, for example, is just looked at different lengths and saw what impact that might have on transmission. So if you put, say, a two-week lockdown or two weeks substantial change in behavior, um, that in that space of time, it won't slow transmission enough because if you imagine you've already got a lot of people infected who are going to become symptomatic. So you don't see that huge reduction in transmission and your outbreak doesn't flatten too much. Um, so you can look at different scenarios and as you extend that, you obviously reduce transmission and then cases who might be ill in hospital, 
they you know if they recover then those beds free up and so you're in a in a better position and yeah we did actually in a lot so in, in the imperial analysis that came out and we've looked at similar scenarios that show that if you have this this kind of intervention where you put in these strong measures and then ease them off and then put them in again um you will spend potentially at least half the year in this this situation where you have very stringent measures so not necessarily six months at once but you might have say a month or two of very stringent interventions you might lift them a bit and then have to put them back in if you have another outbreak um, and so the question of whether that's feasible economically and socially is is one that the governments have to make but we we certainly consider a wide range of scenarios in our analysis yeah. so it'd be good to come back to that scenario uh, planning in the future but before we do one further question on how this has played out um herd immunity suddenly made a an appearance from Patrick Vallance and, and others. Um, and then it quickly became the story that, no, that was not part of our strategy. Again, what was the, the, the scientific discussions around herd immunity and its plausibility as a, as a, as a viable strategy? Yeah, so um, I, I found that messaging you know, incredibly confusing. I think it was, from a public point of view, very misleading. I mean, certainly all of the the modeling our group have been doing, you know, the focus in terms of objective was how do we minimize the impact on, on the NHS? Um, so that was the kind of metrics that we were looking at, looking at deaths, looking at, at kind of bed capacity. Um, I think what, what you do see in a lot of those modeling scenarios is even if you're having this, this process where you lock down and then you lift and you lock down again, in those periods where you still have some transmission, you do build up quite a number of infections. There's a paper out from, from Harvard that they, they were, day before yesterday maybe um looking at the us and they, they found a very similar conclusion that even if you're putting in these measures you will build up quite a few infections immunity along the way so for us it was always um this kind of consequence of of the model that even if you were to put the, these measures in if you struggled to fully have it under control you would over time maybe over a few months build up some infections immunity so i i certainly always saw it as a consequence of the fact this was very tough to control and certainly it wasn't the case that we should just sit back and go through the population and I mean I, I sort of said, I tweeted about it and had a, a few other interviews at the time and I, I really did find that message incredibly unhelpful because there has been I think in the UK and many places an attitude from a lot of people that this is kind of just a bad flu and we should just get it over with and I felt like that message really played into that that you know let's just let it happen let's just get it over and done with and that in our modeling suggests you would quickly overwhelm your health system and that's really not an option um and so i i don't know exactly how up what was happening and what decisions and discussions we've seen some reports over the last few days but um certainly what we were trying to look at you know i, I didn't find that messaging helpful at all right so just in terms of the, the you talked before about the different scenarios for the future um boris johnson has just done a lockdown for three weeks as you said before it's probably going to uh, I imagine that will go on for longer. But what are the different scenarios um, 12, 18 months on from here? Are we likely to yeah. see on-off intermittent lockdowns? Um, could it be more prolonged? Or could we find a way out of this, for instance, through um, mass testing and tracing, yeah. as you suggested earlier? Um, so I, th I think as a baseline scenario, if, you know, if we don't get a vaccine, if we don't get better treatment, if we don't get better testing, um, we're kind of in a situation where because it seems to, to spread through a number of different interactions, you really need quite stringent um, physical distancing between people, so these kind of lockdown measures, to be certain that you can reduce transmission. Um, and so I think what we, we would see in this baseline with no, no improvements elsewhere, this measure potentially in for a few, the, the most severe end of it, potentially a few weeks, and then maybe a month or two of still pretty stringent measures, and then perhaps eased off for a while and if what we've done before could slow transmission, fantastic, but evidence suggests from, from you know, what's happened a month or two ago that that wasn't enough to stop an outbreak. Um, and so then we'd likely need another, um, another kind of more severe lockdown to come in. And in that scenario, you just keep repeating until either the population builds up some immunity um, just because these rounds of, of, of small outbreaks, um, or if you got to a situation where you were developing a vaccine. I think the hope, though, is that we're, we're going to see some innovation and improvement in actually how we, we are able to, to contain it after this, this lockdown phase. So either, for example, if we can get better at identifying what the kinds of interactions that are particularly risky are, 
then it might be that we don't have to, to fully reduce our, our contacts to, to near zero, essentially, and we might be able to have a middle ground. So, for example, in, in Wuhan, um, before the lockdown, people had about 15 social contacts daily on average. Afterwards, um, it went down to about two. And there was a, a paper out recently um, suggesting that actually that level of reduction was was obviously enough to bring it under control, but probably a smaller reduction could also have, have been enough to, to contain it. So I think we could potentially find some middle ground. I think testing is going to be key. Um, and the advantage of being able to kind of test and then some of these suggestions of using phone-based contact tracing, I, I know a few different countries are proposing these measures, is that you could really target the disruption of these these measures at very specific people. So most people could have some element of normal routine, um, but anyone who's who gets infected or has been in contact with these people, you know, you, we could impose, say, a two-week quarantine on them. So it'd be disruptive for those people, but for the majority of the population, um, they could resemble, uh, could resume some kind of normality. Um, and you said before that two may be, two, two people may be too stringent. Have you got any particular thoughts on what the right level of social interaction might be to, to actually contain this? Yeah, so as a, a sort of rough back, back of the envelope, we know that um, in an uncontrolled outbreak, each person infects two or three others uh, on average. And so if you imagine, you know, if you have one case, they infect two, then they infect two, then they infect two, and you get this growing epidemic over time. Um, and we call this, this, this value the reproduction number in my, in my field. And really to control an epidemic, you need to get it below one because you need, if you have a group of people infected, you need them to be generating less infection than there was before. So if each person infects fewer than one more people on average, you're going to get this decline. So if we've got a transmission at, say, each person infecting three and we need to get that below one, then we need to get three down to one. So it's a reduction of just over two thirds. Uh, so potentially, if we could structure something uh, that, that had that kind of effect, and then also, you know, there might be certain situations that are disproportionately important. You know, we found some anecdotal evidence of things like meals and close gatherings. So if those were contributing more to transmission than, say, you know, commute or, or just everyday kind of um, you know, workplace behavior, then targeting those could actually, you know, have a disproportionate effect. And, and maybe we could have a bit more interactions in other areas of life. And how are we collecting that data? How are we working out whether if you get on a tube train versus have dinner with somebody, um, you're more likely to, to get uh, transmission? Because it feels like yeah. that's a critical bit of information that we need to gather in the next few weeks. It is. And um, we're launching um, surveys, London, London School are launching surveys and a number of other institutes of behaviour and very you know, detailed contact behaviour and how it changes over time. Um, because I think, so we did a study uh, with some, some collaborators in, in Cambridge with the BBC a couple of years ago that, that had tracking of social behavior and movement from volunteers in the UK. We had about 90,000 people. So we've got pretty high resolution data on interactions in different groups and where people you know, have contacts at work, at home, in other settings. Have they met people before? So we've got data on that. But obviously, as behavior changes hugely over the coming weeks, um, being able to monitor that and then piece together, you know, if, if transmission is happening, are there characteristics of interactions that help us predict that? And is your current hypothesis that that's likely to be more prolonged interaction like mealtimes rather than picking up a supermarket bag that happens to have um, been touched by somebody who's infected or a tube tray? I, th I think that's our, our theory, yes. Um, just because it, it's not the case that one person gets infected and on average they're infecting 20 other people. So I think that there, there is certainly a risk of, you know, if someone's opened the door handle and they've coughed on their hand, there will be virus there. So there, there's obviously a risk of infection. But I, I don't think it will be the same extent, for example, if you share a meal with four friends and, you know, you're all shaking hands and having bread rolls and, and all this kind of thing. I think there's much more chance of, of exposure in that kind of interaction. So if you play that all out, so hopefully we'll start to learn more about the nature of the, the transmission. We might be able to perhaps have more testing and a rapid contact tracing app that then allows us to um, interact a bit more, but we'll also be able to monitor that interaction, potentially, if you have that kind of app. Um, is that the sort of best case scenario um, unless we get a vaccine or unless we get herd immunity? Um, I think so, yeah. Among, among people in our field, that seems to be uh, emerging as, as a kind of more optimistic scenario because we have evidence that countries have made that work for a period of time. I mean, it's, it's worth emphasising that, 
places like Singapore and, and Korea that have done a really good job of uh, keeping us under wraps. That is a huge resource intensive effort. It's not a kind of really easy thing to implement. And in Singapore, are seeing rising cases and they're having to put in some more measures. So it's not a, a quick fix um, yeah. solution. It will, will take a huge amount of logistics. But I think the, the advantage of having something like that is because it's targeted at people who are at risk. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean you have to have the level of, of control measure that we're currently seeing where it, you know, it's almost kind of medieval in its, in its complexity that we're just shutting people away from each other, which, which is what we need given the current situation to reduce transmission. Um, but really anything where we can target more at people who are at risk, uh, you know, we can hopefully lift um, the restrictions on other areas of life. And just say a little bit more about both the contact tracing app and how you envisage it working is it exactly as it has done in China. Um, and also on the testing side, you know, when do these need to come in place and at what scale? And is, you know, is it feasible that we could get the kind of mass testing in place uh, in the time yeah. scales required? Um, and so I think, I mean, there's a few different versions. Obviously, I, I think we do have to balance things like privacy alongside um, uh, this kind of uh, intervention. Um, because, I mean, within my field, increasingly things like cell phone data are being used in, in modeling. But I think we do have to kind of be aware of if that data is being collected, you know, how is that? Because that's particularly for, for, for countries where there's more of a surveillance, a risk of a surveillance state, that's quite a dangerous technology to be putting in place. Um, but potentially, as, as a concept, it could work where everyone has an app and then you know, maybe locally on your phone, so it doesn't send it to a server, but it, it just pings nearby phones you know, via Bluetooth or something. Um, and then if you get infected, all the phones that have been near yours, say in the last week can get a message to say you know you need to be tested too um so it's kind of very high-tech version of probably a lot of the things we do for stis in the, the you know we do have this kind of um thing yeah you know, this kind of uh behavior already in place for other infections but it would be much quicker and then i think it would rely though on having good testing because the ideal thing is that if someone um has been infected they can get tested but then if you if your phone gets pinged and say you know Three days ago, you were in next to somebody in a restaurant. Um, to, it, the ideal thing would be have a test that's very quick, very uh, accurate. And then if you test negative, you can get on with your life. If you test positive, then you, you, know, you isolate for a week or two. Um, and so you can imagine, it's very easy to say this just sitting here in theory, but you could have a, a thing that if it works efficiently enough and if there's large enough scale testing, then essentially it becomes just a part of life where that is an inconvenience rather than um, something where we're having to have lots of people isolating because they have symptoms. It's not clear where they got infected. And the other thing we can also, that, that is coming in is these kind of antibody tests where we can look at evidence of past exposure. So that would give us an idea of who out there has already had it. And then of the people who haven't, we could have this more detailed contact tracing. And let's just sort of play out another thought experiment, which is um, you could actually lock down people and potentially the virus just dies because you've not allowed it to spread. I think I heard you say on another interview that you'd actually have to lock people down for two months and you'd actually have to lock down everybody, not just the people yeah. now, but health workers and, and so on. But one thought is if you end up with a situation where, I don't know, 10, 20, 30% of the population have got it, um, to what extent could you lock everyone else down, allow them to maintain the skeletal public services um, and, and potentially do it that way? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of different iterations of, of these, these kind of uh, approaches you could use. And I think what we will have to, to start exploring is, is, first of all, once we get an, an idea um, in the next, hopefully next few weeks of how many people have been exposed to this, that might give some sense of how many people might be at a reasonably low risk now, have some immunity um, and, and potentially could resume um, some element of life. As you say, I, I don't know how easy it would be to repurpose people across jobs, but you could envisage um, some, some kind of structuring of things like rotors and things like this to, to ensure that you're not putting a lot of susceptible people together that almost, I mean, again, this is just a complete kind of thought experiment, but if you have people that you know are immune, you know locally, even though nationally you might have heard, might not have heard immunity locally, that will slow down transmission as, as well. If you have, you know, a number of people in a community who are already immune to it, so I think these things could potentially play in um, to to how you you work with things going forward. But of course, 
that relies on getting these tests out to everyone so that they can be confident that they've, that they've actually got some immunity to this. And regarding um, actually getting a certain degree of immunity naturally because it's transmitted so much, when do you think that could be a viable strategy? Um, and then I was also going to ask you about treatment and, and, and vaccines. Which of those different horses would you back in terms of likelihood of coming on stream quickly? Um, so I think in terms of the accumulation of immunity, I think that the priority obviously has to be just making sure our health service isn't uh, overwhelmed. I mean, we, we released some forecasts over the weekend that suggest that even the next week or so, we're probably going to see substantial uh, demand on, on critical care units in this country. Because um, I think we, we estimate there's so many people who are becoming symptomatic and becoming severely ill. So to keep infection at that really low level over time would mean that we'd be looking at, at probably at, well, maybe a year or two before you'd have sufficient infection to build immunity if you're working on that constraint, as we should be, of, of not overwhelming our, our health service. Um, I think it, it is likely that we could very soon get some, um, some potential uh, treatments, so things that are repurposed for, for treating other, say, viral infections. Um, they might not be miracle cures, but they might, you know, if they reduce risk of, of ending up in, in intensive care by, you know, say, even 10%, 20%, then that is, is a sort of reduction in the demand on healthcare. So we could see the, those things coming in quite soon, and then obviously they can be refined um, over time. So I think it, it's not going to be that we'll have one solution that reduces transmission to zero, but we might have all of these kind of 10% and 20% that we can accumulate uh, that actually overall gives us quite good effects in, in controlling this and controlling the impact. Yeah. And you obviously study um, how behaviours become viral, not just... Um, yeah. pandemics and on the more positive side if you end up with the sense that certain types of interaction dinner parties or whatever it is are particularly bad certain ones are, are less bad um, and you can guide the public how confident are you that you can actually shift behavior and get compliance with those guidelines because potentially that can make a huge difference and we could actually um, not be under the same kind of draconian rules but the last few weeks has probably made us all a bit pessimistic about our ability to guide yeah. behavior and i think that's that's a great question and it is it is a real challenge i think one of the things certainly in the research in the book i noticed is that a lot of our our studies of online behavior um tend to focus on fairly low effort outcomes there's a huge number of studies out there of people who retweet something or people who click on the link um which is not putting much demand on someone so that's 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 an event that's quite easy to trigger you don't need a big nudge to get someone to do that so you can study it in, in a lot of detail but obviously getting someone to not have dinner with their friends is, is a much bigger trade-off and i think yeah i'm not, I'm not with the caveat that i'm not a behavioral scientist so I'm, yeah I, I don't know all the studies on that but you know, certainly from what we've seen of a, a lot of um, analysis of how things spread online and how you convert the spread of an idea into actually a behavior um, it does become much harder to, to find effective ways of doing that when you're asking people to make much larger sacrifices. Adam, thanks very much. I'm sure there's a ton of questions for you. Just one final one for me, which is, um, what have you learned in the last few weeks and months? What surprised you? Um, and you know, if you were rewriting your book, would you, would you change much about it? Um, so yeah, there's been a few things. I mean, uh, I think we'd always feared um, this, this virus, yeah, a virus, a hypothetical virus that um, had caused a lot of severity, had a lot of its infection early on. So, so a lot of viruses, things like SARS, Ebola, a lot of the infect, infectiousness occurs late in infection when people are more severely ill. So it makes it easier to spot people who, who are potentially transmitting. This virus, I remember, I think it was end of January, early February, seeing some very rough data that suggested a lot of transmission was happening early on, maybe before people had symptoms. And I, just, I did remember thinking, this is going to be so, so difficult to control if this data is true. Um, and so it is, it is kind of strange, I think, seeing that the hy hypothetical kind of disease X scenario, which I'd often mentioned in talks, actually uh, appear in reality. Um, I mean, going through the book, one thing I, I did notice that stood out actually was um, I'm, I, I talk a bit about travel and interactions and, and use SARS no, as an example. But the, the order of the countries it, it reached, um, I realized, is, is very different now to what it was for SARS. And actually, looking up the flight data, the flight volumes have increased about threefold out of China. So actually, even I think my mental model of China's connectivity to the world 
um, was very different. I didn't actually realize that London had direct flights with Wuhan and, and this sort of thing. So I think even that in the space of a few years, um, a lot of us have had to update our, our kind of ideas about exactly how these connections look. Adam, thank you so much. We've now got some time, I think about sort of 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Um, one of them that's come up here is about the University of Oxford releasing a model today estimating that COVID-19 reached yeah. the UK earlier than previously thought in January and may have infected already half the population. Um, what do you think? Yes, yeah, so I had a, a look through that earlier. Um, I, I don't think that the headlines quite capture what the model's um, done. So what they, they show is that if you look at the, the trend of the epidemic in the UK, um, that could be consistent with um, an epidemic where uh, a lot of people who become ill um, end up uh, dying. So the, the number of deaths we see over time, it could be an outbreak where it's very severe. But equally, just based on those data, it could be an outbreak where there's a lot of infections and relatively few of them are severe. Because if you imagine the number of deaths might be the same, it just scales up. There's a lot of infections and you know, relatively few risk or few infections and relatively high risk. Um, and they, they looked at that for, for the UK and Italy and, and made that observation. So the point that study was really trying to make is we need these serological surveys, these studies of, of exposure to be able to distinguish exactly how much um, infection has occurred within the population because it's quite difficult to untangle. Um, I think the media presented it a bit as this model contradicts the other one, but I think the, the, a lot of the scenario models that have been made for the UK have been informed by other data sources. For example, the, the Diamond Princess cruise ship, we saw that uh, a fairly high proportion of people did have symptoms, at least half of them seem to, um, on the evacuation flights that have come out where they've They've swabbed everybody, you know, again, about half of people seem to have um, symptoms. So I'd certainly you know, be very happy if it was the case we had all these asymptomatic infections that would have been missed. But I think the fragments of data that we do have um, at the moment aren't pointing to a situation where we've got, you know, 90 plus percent of our infections not showing up with any symptoms. Thanks. Um one question is about whether your modeling is informed by the concepts of complexity theory and system dynamics, and if so, in what ways? And, and perhaps just to build on that, it would be just interesting to know um, how are you building on or distinct from a lot of the social network theory yeah. um, that's, um, that's been out for many decades? Yeah, um, so I guess those are, those are quite broad terms, but I suspect a lot of that will feed it, because you know, a lot of the, the kind of evolution of these approaches came under the umbrellas of a lot of those other fields as well in terms of network theory and and particularly the models we've done looking at feasibility of contact tracing and what's what makes it successful and not successful for this pathogen you know we do look at individual level behavior i mean one of the, the, the most notable things is this concept of super spreading that you can have although the average uh you know amount of spread is is about two infections per per you know per case you will see variations so a lot of people might in fact know nobody and then some people might infect 10 20 more so we do account for that kind of variation and that's obviously something that, that comes out of interactions as well if you look at human interaction data human social networks you see quite a lot of variation at the individual level in terms of contact made so we do try and incorporate those features of, of kind of networks and behavior that are relevant you may have covered this already adam but um one question is is the pandemic playing out as expected um are your models actually um aligning with the emerging findings? Um, so I think a lot of the, the early uh, dynamics and what we, we see now, we, so we're now tracking transmission across a number of countries and actually there's early patterns in China where each person is infecting two or three more, which is actually really similar to SARS in its early stages in terms of the extent of transmission. Um, and that's now playing out across a number of countries. So almost that early growth before control measures go in seems pretty clockwork. Um, across a number of countries. I think the big difference though is what happens next because obviously the timing of control measures and how effectively they're implemented makes a big difference. I think that's very hard to predict. I think we can look at a range of scenarios but actually saying you know from now in the UK what we see in the next couple of weeks is going to be really dependent on how seriously people were taking the advice over the last couple of weeks and I think that's something where beyond a quite large range of uncertainty it's, it's hard to say exactly what it'll look like. Um, 
you your book sort of explores outbreaks and contagions in fields as diverse as violent crime, financial markets, social media, opioid addiction. Um, what made you look for patterns across those diverse fields and, and why did you want to write it? Um, so over the years, I think quite a lot of people who work in my field and people that I really respect have, have done some work in these other areas. So some who, who worked with central banks in post-financial crisis. And I know some people who've, who've looked at elements of, um, of violence. Some researchers at, at London School, for example, who I mentioned in the book, have done a lot of really pioneering work on domestic violence and, and drivers of that. And then as well, some of the, the ideas for genetics for tracking outbreaks people are now applying to things like the spread of culture. So I'd always had those other applications on the periphery. And I think certainly um, online contagion, we just have a, a huge amount of data that, that certainly wouldn't ever be possible um, in an infectious disease outbreak. So it was, it was partly driven by curiosity that I wanted to see how these ideas were playing out. But I think also uh, there was there's potentially some, some really valuable lessons that if people are bringing ideas from other fields and using it to do things more effectively, I thought that was an opportunity actually just to lay it out and, and you know, help people think about these things in a more useful way. Thank you. And uh, another question about the wider impacts of um, the COVID response on the, on the health system and the economy. So is there any modelling to show that what number of deaths from secondary impacts of the response to COVID-19 will be under different scenarios? Um, and do you or others plan to do that modelling? So we we don't, but there are modelling groups looking at a whole number of aspects of this. So there are, um, within NHS, for example, there will be modelling groups looking at um, you know, implications for demand and, and what that can be done in terms of health capacity. There will be groups looking at, um, obviously, economic implications. And I think that is a good point of the, the measures that, that are being put in you know, will have health outcomes as well. And, and I don't know off the top of my head exactly the groups looking at that, but I know that there is... An evident base around that. I think it'll also be important, as some people are, I know are doing, to set up studies to monitor this. That if we're if we're getting people to to isolate and, and be in their houses for a long period of time, actually tracking what that means for the population, I think it's going to be important as well. Great. Um, and then one question about how, um, as well as reducing the number of contacts per day, we're also reducing infectiousness per contact through hand washing, for instance. Yeah. Are there more ways we could reduce infectiousness and then relax distancing? I think that's a good question. Um, again, in part, it will be disentangling uh, the roots of transmission. One of the hard things is, for example, a lot of studies have found, as you'd expect, a lot of transmission happens within the household. But is that because someone's touched the surface? Is that because you know, someone's had direct contact? Is that through some other route? Um, and actually, with the data... The early data we had from China, it was really hard to, to untangle that. I think as we get better data from Europe, we'll be able to, to start to, to separate that. Because as, as you say, hand washing will have some effect. But if it turns out actually that wiping down surfaces gives you an extra 10, 20% off transmission, that's something that could be a really easy additional intervention. And are those kind of tests being done or, or do we need more of that kind of experimental work? Um, they, they are. So I know there's a, a number of experimental studies that, that are coming out in the last week or so about virus survival on surfaces. But I think we also just need really good um, follow-up and insights into behavior of people who become infected. So you know, if, if someone's infected, following up their contacts and really working out what were these interactions and, and what drove these outbreaks. And there's some data out of Japan recently for example, looking at different contexts, and they found that I think gyms were seemed particularly notable for a lot of these kind of multiple transmission events. Um, but that was looking at you know maybe forty clusters of infection, so it wasn't enough to say definitively that this is this is where the problem is going on. It may well be that restaurants or something else was also contributing. So I think the more we can pin down what's actually where these exposures are happening, you know, the more we can hopefully uh, you know, have some more targeted measures. Right, and I think you might have covered this already, but I, I think one other question is about the predictability within certain structures of events that, like follow-up shootings in gun crime areas, yeah. suggests that um, there might be pockets of outbreaks when restrictions on movement are lifted. And I think you were basically saying, yes, that's likely to happen under the current I think circumstances. I, I think that's very likely to happen. Um, and I think, I mean, you can almost just, you don't need a model to look at that. You can just see what happened a few weeks ago where a few cases yeah. came into Europe and very quickly grew. Um, and I think the key thing is, is how do we stop that happening again?
Um, so final two questions, um, I'm just broadening it out a little bit. One is, you know, you're taking part in this event with us, with Nesta, who are an innovation foundation. In your book, you also talk about how innovations spread. And that's something that we're particularly interested in because everyone knows that there are lots of good ideas and good pilots, but they often don't diffuse. Um, interested in your perspective on um, what we can do to actually spread innovation. Um, and then a sort of second question from me, really, which is, is there an area which you think is ignored within this current crisis that we could be trying to stimulate new innovation around, whether that's um, particularly around social distancing or behavior change or um, any of the things we've talked about? Because yeah. I think probably everybody listening to this, um, uh, you know, philanthropists and government are thinking, what more could we do? And is there something that is being ignored that we could um, address? Yeah. Um, so I think on that first point of innovation, I mean, I think one of the things that I found really interesting uh, in terms of recent um, development of research in, in the book is this idea of, of what's known as complex contagions. So I think often we think of how things spread much like a virus. And, you know, you, you have an interaction with someone, you get exposed, you expose someone else. But a lot of evidence that particularly ideas or, or kind of beliefs or these kind of things need social reinforcement. So actually, you need multiple exposures um, to adopt it. So one example is the, the equal sign on people's Facebook profiles a few years ago for marriage equality. Generally, people wouldn't um, adopt that until they had seen many others do it as well. They needed that kind of social reinforcement. And if you think about a network structure, that changes the dynamics. Because if things are these what we call simple contagions, where it just takes one exposure to say, spread an innovation or get someone to, to take up a new idea, then acquaintances can be a very powerful way of, of spreading that because, you know, these, these people that might link you to other bits of the network uh, can be very helpful. But if you have these kind of complex contagions and you need some social reinforcement, then actually having some pockets of clustering can, can help you with that. So think about the structure of a, of a company, actually having those kind of more tight-knit pockets in terms of almost incubators for innovation can can help those establish and then having those those wider links to help them spread more um, or spread further can be very useful and I think that uh, some of the research into this has also really sheds light on a kind of content online that because a lot of these quite nuanced difficult views take reinforcement typically you know online um, behavior tends to favor things that are very simple and shareable without needing that kind of complex nuance um, around it. So I think thinking more, not just of this idea of a simple virus spreading as an innovation, but actually how do you build that kind of community reinforcement initially before then it, it subsequently grows. I think your point about um, innovation for this outbreak, um, I, mean, I think there was a, a lovely quote by um, uh, a colleague in the US who said, you know, this is, this is essentially our Apollo program, that you know, we're in a situation where we know we can lock down and, and reduce transmission. It's not entirely clear yet at scale in multiple countries, and, and not just you know, countries that can reproduce career stuff with career type approach with, without too much effort, but you know, what about countries in Africa, countries in, in, in you know, other bits of Asia? How can they keep this thing under wraps without having to shut down their countries? And I think that's going to require innovation at scale uh, to work out you know, how can we get basically back to normal life but track and control infection quick enough. I think, I think technology and innovation has a huge role to play there. And on that final point, Adam, I mean, what worries me particularly is how this starts to spread to some of the lower income and crisis-affected contexts. And, you know, whether we have the modeling capacity and help to actually um, get ahead of this and, and, and uh, provide the right kind of support, is that something that your team is is doing that's now? that's what we're actively doing yes we're working with a number of partners um across across africa modeling in a number of scenarios um but i think that the challenge is that the particularly in some of those settings the um the basket of measures they have open to them as prevent potential control measures aren't going to be the same as, as they are elsewhere um and i think though one at sort of slight advantage they do have in this situation is a lot of those populations are much younger on average than you might see in somewhere like Italy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, on that, at least the gradient of severity will probably be less uh, overall in the population because of that. But, you know, you, you do have to balance that against the fact that, that maybe the capacity to deal with this won't be the same. 
Adam Kaczalski, thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you and thank you for answering all those um, great questions. So thank you and thank you to everyone for, for joining. Right, thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye now.